Okay, so um, basically the, the uh, refractive session two today, uh, we are going to discuss the advances in management of press biopia. Uh, and um, we have very eminent uh, panelists today. The first speaker is uh, Professor Ambrosio from uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, he's a well-known uh, person. Uh, we all do his uh, pentacam for keratoconus. So let's start with his uh, video recording presentation. Thank you. Hi, I am Renato Ambrosio from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm very happy and honored to participate in this nice session of Press Biopen Management beyond 2020 and 2022. These are my financial disclosures, in, and I'd also like to acknowledge the participation of some good friends and colleagues from around the world. Refractive surgery has been recognized as a subspecialty of ophthalmology, but today I think is a new super specialty of medicine in which we deal with refractive elective procedures for refractive surgery, refractive correction, but the main goal is patient satisfaction and enhancing quality of life and quality of vision. This is one of the main purposes to make refractive surgery more understood and more uh, uh, really enhancing the, the level of recognition of refractive surgery in the great work lead by Guy Kaziri and the World College of Refractive Surgery and Visual Sciences. When we consider press by open management, I think it's very important to understand the problem of the lens and the ciliated body complex. So lens dysfunction is uh, the first stage of presbyopia. We have to understand the patient's needs and individualized approach based on multimodal refractive imaging, considering the available options and the future perspectives. We have seen a huge development on presbyopia topical agents. Most of them would enhance meiosis and eventually try to work a little bit on the stimulation of the ciliated body with pharmacological agents. The, Meiosis presbyopia treatment is very simple to understand, is the effect of a pinhole in which we have an incre increase in depth of focus so that we have foci that would be focused on the, the, on the macula for, distant, uh, for different distances. However, we have also the approach for enhancing the crystalline lens flexibility with the lipolic acid that uh, inside the eye, would undergo a metabolic pathway to reduce the disulfide bones between the lens proteins so that we have restoration of accommodation so that the lens is more flexible for the microfluidics and enhancing the indices of refraction along with the sparsity of the lens. Interestingly, we have also approaches that can be eventually revolutionizing our specialty, which is the lentotomy with a phaco restoration from Kejaku with a femtosecond laser that we can enhance the ability for the crystal lens to accommodate again. This can be combined with ciliary body electrostimulation, like the chimera procedure, which we, we stimulate through the sclera with this nice device the, 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 the crystal lens to accommodate through the stimulus of the ciliary body. I was able to analyze the data from Luca Gaudi and publish this paper with him in the JRS, he, in which he got the honor for being recognized with the medal for George Warren III. And I was so enthusiastic about that. I even had the procedure myself in both eyes, and I can make my testimony that it does work. However, it does work for a limited time. We have other procedures that have become uh, historical, but today we have basically two main procedures. We have laser vision correction, and we have to recognize a great work by Dan Reinstein, who put together the understanding that blended vision is not the same as monovision. We have the control of high order aberrations, especially the spherical aberration for enhancing depth of focus, and having this available with smile in the future is one of very, very interesting uh, uh, perspectives. But today we can do that only with LASIK and surface ablation. Custom wavefront guided, ocular wavefront guided, and eventually topo guided can even further improve the control of the high order aberrations in the centration for improving the depth of focus and for even making this very nice procedures individualized and customized for the patient. Refractive cataract surgery and lens dysfunction is a huge 
uh, and very important concept. Uh, they, Dave and I, and Guy Kazirin did a very nice interview this year, the AAO, that the future of refractive surgery goes to inside the eye, not with cataract surgery, but with fake KOLs. And I do agree that one of the major advances of refractive surgery is to recognize that cataract surgery is the most common refractive procedure that we do today. The understanding of lens dysfunction and how to educate the patient is a very nice contribution by Dan Dury. And we have to understand all of that as a refractive cataract surgery. A few years ago, I was asked to give my definition of refractive cataract surgery. And I would say that this is the cataract procedure that we have an individualized planning for making the patient as better as possible, as best as possible for uh, uh, considering anatomy of the eye, optical properties the patient needs and a comprehensive evaluation of the patients, including binacular area, the transparency of the cornea, the regularity of the cornea, the endothelial status, the anterior chamber and lens characteristics, and the ocular health, considering ocular uh, optic nerve, the uh, periphery of the retina, the, the macula, the vitreous transparency, so that we have the mindset for making the patient as happy as possible in a very efficient and very safe procedure. We do have a medical medical needs considering the exam capabilities, but we have multimodal technologies that can help us to diagnose when and how to do refractive surgery for presbyopia, considering cornea, considering the lens. Interestingly, the, the, the algorithm A2I squared, which is the application of artificial intelligence and national intelligence, the philosophy on the whys and the hows for making conscious decisions, like in the ARV, the Ambrosio Robertson Vinciguera integration of tomography and biomechanics with three one-out cross-validation for random forest approach in the TBI. This is a very good example of this application. This patient was very unhappy with a trifocal toric. And this makes the point that the screening for ectasia is not only important for laser vision correction on the coin, but also for the lens-based procedures. And this patient has a low K keratoconus that is easily identified here. We advise for exchanging the IOL, and this patient got much better. This was very nicely reviewed in a very nice letter from last year from Shizuka Ko, in which she looked at the estimation of the diagnosis of corneal abnormalities considering placebo topography, tomography of the shine fluid, and integration tomography and biomechanics. This is a very good example. This patient does not uh, wear glasses. He is recently bothered by his loss of the accommodation ability, and he is uh, uh, really seeking for help. He has mild keratoconus in the right eye and the left eye. You can really uh, be kind of in question of the changes that you have uh, available in the back of the cornea. But when we consider the integration of tomography and biomechanics, the deformation response, the integration of TBI makes it clear that this is a very mild keratoconus or form fruits keratoconus and a very mild keratoconus in the right eye. So this patient has lens dysfunction, and you can characterize that based on the shine flow. And eventually, the best advice for this patient is really to wait or eventually to do clear lens extraction. Clear lens extraction, I do believe it's something that we have to be very cautious on the diagnosis for the mild cataract and this needs objective documentation. So that here in the stage three, this was very nicely reviewed in this review paper uh, uh, in the Brazilian Journal of Ophthalmology that we can make a conscious decision based on the shine fluke imaging and also in the integration of corneal topography and whole eye wavefront. This was very nicely seen since 2004 when we integrated topography and whole eye wavefront and also with shine fluke imaging for cataract uh, the, the detection. This was part of Fernando Faria Correa's thesis. And also, when we consider management beyond 2020, patient education is a must. Under, correct, uh, under promise and over delivery is a must. Understanding patients' need with multimodal imaging, enhancing characterization of the cornea and the lens, considering tear film analysis, endothelium biomechanics of the cornea, the lens status for planning which IOL, corneal presbyopic approaches, and considering the type of IOL that you choose for the patient and eventually considering the new technologies for add-on with uh, multifocality, with a DOF lens, adjustable lens, and eventually accommodating lens that will come in the future. So the future is promising for presbyopic treatment, and I do believe that soon 
we will have restoration of accommodation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ambrosio. That was great. Now we know there's a multimodal approach to presbyopic treatment. Uh, our next uh, panelist and uh, our guest speaker is George, Professor George Alio from Spain. Uh, he's going to talk to us about accommodative IOLs. Okay, Professor. Hello. Good morning for you, and I am happy to participate in this very interesting session with so many friends. And the topic of this presentation, let me open it first, is about the use of multifocal lenses. Okay, thank you very much. So, the topic of my presentation is accommodative IOLs. I have this topic as one of my favorites now because the things are progressing, as you would see, and we have innovations in this area that would be interesting for you. These are my, my, my financial disclosure for the purpose of this presentation. First of all, the, the main question is, can we restore accommodation? It's a complex uh, a mechanism that is beyond our, not, uh, our, our understanding still today, even that it was in 1836 that Helmut Borg defined the, the theory that is already more in use. In the past, we had accommodative IOLs that failed, and this is one of the, of the main issues in our uh, background at this moment, because errors, poor methodology, commercial bias, and poor monitorization make lenses that were actually not accommodating to be offered in the market as accommodative lenses, and still today, they are offered like that. Here, you see an independent study that we performed with the lenses that at that moment were, were in, in, designed as accommodated that totally failed, and we demonstrated that there was no benefit in using these lenses for near vision, unless they have a near vision app, as it happened with the vista lens. With this in mind, we have to remember that we have three basic approaches to obtain accommodation with a lens. Change in axial position, change in shape of curvature, and change in refractive index of power. These are the three in which we have to fund fundament our accommodative lens. And the second question is whether this lens should be or not in the back. Because in the inside the back, we have a different uh, problems because the, the back, as you would see immediately, has some uh, limitations. Like it is a basal membrane. You remember from the anatomy, this is the basal membrane of the, of the lens epithelium. And once that a casual back is empty, there are no functions and no anatomical reasons for the back to exist. Carosis and atrophy are so unavoidable. It, they will happen in every one casual bag, and the casual bag cannot function in the long term with this empty. So, whatever we place in the bag will fail because of fibrosis. We have, the, for this reason, the approach to use the exulcus as the, as the source, as a place to, to, to harbor our lens. And indeed, this was the initial project that we started to implant the lens in the exulcus for to gain accommodation. Based on that, we, uh, we started a study that has been published, as you see here, in 1915, with a monkey study in which we were placing in the, in the sulcus and in the back a, 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 a device that could measure the forces induced by the re-stimulation of the ethical works or a, by pilocarpus. We could demonstrate that even uh, three years after the surgery, these uh, lenses of these uh, forces still existed. And not only that, after this long time, up to five years, the sulcus was tolerated well, these lenses, as you can see in the image, in which we see in this in vivo endoscopy in the monkeys, no atrophy of the ciliary body uh, processes. So the casual bag is a wrong location for an accommodative lens. The forces generated on the sonar anterior capsule are probably those that are used to for accommodative lenses. And this is why we designed this lens, uh, which is based in two very focal surfaces that when the ciliary body co contracts and relax, it slides one lens into the other, creating a continuous change in power of the lens. That means real accommodation. This is the lens profile in the sulcus, as you see the two uh, very focal surfaces are uh, moved by the frontal forces that are generated in the ciliary body. Uh, the initial studies that we performed were positive, and you see here that the objective accommodation studied by one, the web from analyzer, it really demonstrated that with the celery body action, we had a change in power in the, uh, in the lens, the accommodated lens that we were studying, and not in the monofocal lens. You can see here another study that is published in Euler Factors in 2008, how accommodation uh, 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 was compared with a young uh, 30 years uh, control. Uh, was about the same, even that weaker, and about 70% of the effect of three diet tests that could be obtained in a young person of 30 years could be accomplished with the lens. Obviously, if our ability exists, and you see here different, uh, the focus curve profiles that, the, that really the in, uh, identify a um, function that is variable depending uh, to patient to patient. But in all of them, you gain accommodation. 
Quando se sentì, as a consequence, da obina monofocal lens, with a, con, with a power change, a conducere a reaction is normal. And the results of this study, well published in American Ophthalmology, and these initial studies led us to design a phase two and phase three study with this lens that have been finished now. This is the actual lens Lumina. The latest design is a thinner lens implanted in the sulcus with a, with a hydrophilic uh, material, very stable and with a, a long story of more than eight years of follow up at this very moment. You can see here that the most recent results indicate that we have a full range of high visual acuity, including intermediate vision with this lens, as you see here in the image. We have no use of glasses in most of the cases implanted with the Lumina, with functional reading ability that is accomplished in most of the cases as little or no difficulty, very good outcomes. The, the, it is stable after 3.3 years after surgery, and uh, you can see here both in the distance with the near visual acuity and in the focus scope, that means that the, the far vision that basin is excellent, and the focus scope is kept with the advantage of accommodating the shop three to four years later with a normal contrast sensitivity, as you can see here in this image, which is really important as well, because this is one of the pitfalls of modern multifocal lenses. And even the, uh, with a casual break, in the posterior capsule, this lens functions because what, what this lens needs is the anterior capsule and remains and not the posterior capsule. Actually, the posterior capsule, you will see immediately, is not necessary for accommodation with this lens and probably is not necessary for accommodation in the human being. So good news, if you break the capsule, you still can use this lens uh, as far as you get the anterior uh, capsule. The focus score, you can see here in this image in question one eye, in the same patient was with the casual break in the other was in the lateral eye, even the casual break eye was doing even better, even that not significant, than the case that the contralateral eye implanted with a normal look. In conclusion, the phase three study confirms a significant improvement in near vision after cataract surgery. Near vision arcos correlated well with high patient satisfaction in implanted patients. The posterior capsule doesn't show to be necessary for surgical accommodation, and the lumina can be implanted safely and successfully following a casual break. And yet, casual them improves the near vision performance of the lumina lens, so the diagnosis is not negative, but rather is positive one that the casual fibrosis has happened, and the laser stimulates the performance. One important study that we have finished now is the quality of retinal image study analyzing the MTF and the PSF by pyramidal algorithms. Look here, compared with the SA60, the, the very well known uh, aspheric lens of alcohol, how is the, the quality of retinal image of the lumina is almost identical. That means that we, it works as a monofocal lens in terms of quality of vision. But if you compare the, 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 the same lens, the, the alcohol SA60, with a lens like the mini well, which is under lens, look how awful PSF ratio has and how is the quality of retail image, which is very different. You can see that uh, all these are the advantages of, of a uh, lens. You have the evidence published in American Journal of Tablet, GRS, in, from our studies, and other studies have been published recently about the quality of retail image with these lenses compared with monofocals and monofocal lenses. So remember, multifocality, which is the standard today, is not physiological. Multifocal optics will always require some degree of neuro adaptation, but once that recommendation is, we will be unable to compete as it happened with So this is what is waiting for us. So now I would like to show to you how the lens is implanted. This is a fraction of our, one of the surgeries in which we, uh, I can show to you how we do the surgery. We uh, perform the incision in the positive marine of the eye in order to decrease the astigmatism, if any, is present in this eye. We perform two paracentesis and we work in this way with my with my precision surgery, which is feasible. In this case, is once that we have emptied the capsular bag, we clean the, the, the anterior capsular uh, uh, lens, uh, epithelium lens, and we fill up the sulcus with the with the viscoelastic. We're not filling the bag, but rather the sulcus in order to open the sulcus. And then now we are opening the, the incision at uh, three millimeters is this incision size that where now we need to inject the lumina and the lumina will be injected in the, in the, in the sulcus. This lens is customized for the, for the sulcus uh, uh, distance that is measured in the patient prepared with, uh, with OCT, precisely with the Cassian technology, and it has a precise uh, position to, to place. It has to be placed with the, this, uh, this part of the lens uh, facing up. And once that you get the position of the lens, it is uh, loaded in the cartridge. The cartridge is a, a normal one that you can use. And definitely you have to, to put the tip in the anterior chamber. You cannot use the, the corneal 
approach and the distal haptic is implanted in the sulcus while the trial haptic is implanted so it's straightforward in the sulcus as well so it's a straightforward maneuver the casual bag is behind the, the, the continuous car source is behind as well and then you clean the viscoelastic from the anterior surface of the legs and from behind as you do in the normal i want to remind you that we have this online course on refractive corneal lens surgery that is provided by our university you know, over 500 hours of teaching activities online in English dealing with this amazing and extremely exciting area for refractive corneal lens surgery. All the junior staff and residents are uh, invited to join this course because that I'm sure that you will enjoy a lot. I want to thank you very much for your kind invitation and I feel very uh, unhappy not to be in Dubai. I see that I like very much and to enjoy both the friendship of my colleagues and the beauty of this. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, that was a very nice lecture. We'll just keep the questions for the last. Uh, now I would uh, like to request uh, Dr. Khalid to speak on uh, lens-based uh, approach to treat breast biopia. Dr. Khalid. Thank you. Th thank you very much. I will start sharing my screen. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you for the invitation. I will be talk about the lens-based management. Uh, I have the, the, my lecture outline. I will list some of the available lenses, and then uh, I will talk about the existing terminology, and finally about the patient selection in a very quick way. Uh, one fact that I want to mention that there is no lens available at the moment or will be available in the near future that can resemble the natural lens because our natural lens, lens is a living organ that we are replacing with a with a uh, with a lens that is not uh, uh, that does not has a complete multifocality, does not have a zero photopic phenomena, and uh, a lens that can there is no available lens that can preserve the contrast uh, fully. So the first uh, multifocals or bifocal lenses that were available, like the Restore from Alcon or the Thickness from Johnson and Johnson, and the Atliza from Zayas, and then we have the uh, Rainer lenses like the MFlex. And one thing that I want to mention when when we are faced or when we are using these lenses, uh, that the add power when we say, for example, the Restore plus two point five. At power, this, this will give this will give uh, the patient the ability to read at 53 centimeter rather than at 40 centimeter because this ad is at the lens plane and not at the spectacle plane. Then the second, the second, uh, uh, then came the trifocal lens in a, in a way to that they try to decrease the photophobia that was common with the multifocals, with the early multifocal lenses, and they try to improve the intermediate visions. Came the Banoptics from Alcon or the Atliza Tri from Zayas, Ray One from Rayner, and the, the Visual, the Fine Vision uh, family of Visual uh, IOLs. Uh, today's we are. Uh, 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 fully uh, seeing the EDOF lenses, the EDOF EDOF IOLs, whether these are uh, multifocal lenses like the Thickness Symphony or the Thickness Synergy from Johnson & Johnson or the Atlara from Zayas or the Trime from Visual, or we have the EDOF monofocal like the Vivity and the Eyes Pure 1, 2, 3. Uh, then the extended depth of focus, if we want to talk about these lenses, uh, there is uh, actually true uh, two to true uh, actual EDOF lenses. And I will come to say, uh, I will discuss this later, why these are the only true EDOF lenses, because these two lenses, the IC8, AccuFocus, and the Extra Focus, are using the pinhole effect. And the IC8 it's function mainly as the camera inlay insert, uh, it's used the same principle, and they primarily introduced to be used in patients with the uh, high photophobia and irregular astigmatism, especially those after uh, PKPs. And this lens has a small aperture of around 1.3 millimeter. And it's, uh, it's uh, recommended to be inserted in the non-dominant eye, while the other dominant eye to be used with a monofocal lens. And the extra focus one is a sulcus based. It's a biggie bag IOL. It's uh, made of an infrared transparent material, though it appears as a black or a, a, an opaque lens, but actually it's a transparent lens that is designed to be uh, inserted in the sulcus. 
So the, the, the other group of, of uh, presbyopia corrective lenses, the accommodative IOL, which was prescribed nicely by Dr. George, and the big bike IOLs, and recently there is the Viva from ICL. And the accommodative uh, uh, IOL already covered. The big bag IOL, there is three groups that are used in the, to be used in the sulcus, like the sulcoflex from Lehner. We have the add-on uh, from human optics, and we have also the first add-on from another German company. The Viva ICL, it's a new lens that is not widely distributed, but it's a new lens that is introduced and it has an edof effect that is indicated to, to treat presbyopia and can be used in phakic or in zoodophakic eyes. And the second part of my talk is the terminology. Now we are facing a lot of uh, terms in the industry. And this uh, one of this uh, one one of the nice articles that goes through all these lenses is this one that was published in the ophthalmology. And if you if you want to understand this terminology, we need to look at the mechanism of action of these uh, lenses that are available in the market because most of these are could be zonal refractive lenses, could be diffractive lenses, or small aperture lenses, or accommodative, or could be combined. Use the combined. Uh, the, the refractive IOL, these are zonal, means that they have distinct regions that reflect light differently with the refraction determining the way the light rays is bent. And the, the optical power of these lenses is dependent on the local surface curvature. And usually these lenses has a blend zone uh, to, to decrease the stray light effect. And they use also the sphericity that they increase the negative sphericity of the eye in order to uh, take advantage of some of the higher order operations. And the diffractive IOL, these lenses take advantage of the wave nature of light, and these uh, are basically a monofocal lens with an overlying diffractive element. So the multifocality here is achieved through the diffractive nature of the light. Uh, and now, what are the terminology that we are hearing about these lenses? The presbyopia correcting IOL, when we learn uh, we were first know that PCI oil is a pure chamber. Now PCI oil is a presbyopia correcting eye oil. Uh, other terms like premium eye oil, high performance lenses, custom lens replacements, multifocal, trifocal, edof lenses. Edof lenses. Where this term came from? I think this term came from the from the field of photography, where they, in camera they use the term edof as the extended depth of field, while in ophthalmology you are using this term as extended depth of focus. And also this term is used by the uh, American College of Emergency Physicians, where they call it the emergency department of the future. So in, in thermology, this term from the, came from the camera, uh, and the aim was for the camera is to give a range of distance over which a subject appears in focus without sacrificing the resolution or the brightness of the image. And this can be achieved in camera only if we have a small aperture. And if we apply this to our lenses, then we need we can see why we we said there is only true uh, two true head of lenses, which is the extra focus and the IC eight lenses. Uh, the head of lenses, and then came the American National Standard Institute, which has issued a consensus statement that any head of any lens that we should be labeled as an head of lens should have an extended far focus area that reaches the intermediate distance that provide excellent distance and intermediate vision. So, so these lenses should have a, a, an advantage over the monofocal lenses that they are providing a, a better intermediate vision. And this uh, can only be achieved through the asphericity of the, working on the asphericity of the lens, and this will increase the depth of focus. Also, we can uh, sometimes we hear the terms such as the ischlitz. What are the ischlitz? Ischlitz is just just a diffractive grating. Some companies using the X-wave technology, where they claim that this technology stretches lights and slow it, it down. But actually, this is just a bifocal, central, sectorial blended zones. Other companies using the terms continuous transitional focus, which is just also a sectorial, bifocal refractive lenses. So. If we want to classify the aid of lenses in a more accurate manner, I think uh, the, what is 
available in the market as a monofocal is of it's better termed as enhanced monofocal lenses because these lenses only give some extra intermediate vision not more than that and uh, when these are combined with a multifocal uh, diffractive or refractive lenses this is they have some ed of effect and the true ed of lenses as we mentioned the only two are that i'm aware of are the ic8 and the extra focus lenses the final part of my talk is about the patient selection when what are the patients that are suitable for these lenses usually patients above the age of 50 uh, i don't recommend to use them for patients who has uncorrected distance visual, visual acuity of 66 even if i face with a patient that he is 60 years uh, with 66 distance vision he is wearing green glasses of 2 or 2.5 i don't advise to use these lenses for such kind of patients uh, usually it's advisable to be used with, in patients with good visual potential that they have no corneal scarring, for example, no macular pathology, no glaucoma, and advisable to be used in patients with no astigmatism. And if we want to use them in patients with astigmatism, better to be used in patients with regular astigmatism and we can benefit from the toric trifocals. And not for young, if I faced with a young patient with unilateral cataract, I don't advise to use these for these patients. And also, we should look at the higher order operation of these patients, and we should look at the CWC or the angle kappa. Because our patients' perspectives, they want to be free from spectacles. They want to have a maximum range of focus. They want to have a limited dysphotopsia, and they want to have limited adverse effects. But what, can we achieve this to the patients? Because dysphotopsia is the major limitation of these uh, lenses and this should be explained to the patients preoperatively pre and we should don't, shouldn't wait the patient to report these symptoms for us after the operation. So uh, how to set the patient expectations? I usually will tell the patient that they will get a good range of vision, great distance and good functional near vision and uh, you should, the, the patient should understand they, that they might need uh, uh, reading glasses for small, some near task like reading small prints. And what I usually tell my patients that if we use a monofocal lens, uh, usually the patients will get a 2.5 uh, presbyopic lens uh, spectacles. But if we use these lenses, usually these patients will need uh, in the range of plus one for a small prints. And we also should explain to the patients that they should be aware that they may notice uh, clear and hollows. So the, the major uh, motivation behind these lenses uh, is the photopic phenomena. So we should address this to the patients preoperatively. We should uh, carefully select our patients and set their expectations so, uh, so as to get a happy and uh, acceptable results from, for our patients. And the final thing that sometimes, uh, 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 whether can we use these lenses in after the laser vision correction? Uh, I think yes, if patients have a good ablation profile, good centration, if they have good large optical zones, if we have uh, uh, access to uh, the new formulas, IO calculation formula, if we have devices that can calculate the posterior corneal astigmatisms, and if the patient that understand that they might need a laser touch up, but it's not advisable if there is decent ablation, if there is high higher order ablations, or if the K readings are at the extreme of the K readings. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khaled. Uh, that was a great uh, talk. I will have the questions at the last. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Professor Rohit Sethi from India to talk about cornea based presbyopic uh, treatment. Thank you. Uh, I think I have uh, loaded my presentation. If the team can help in uh, loading it up, please. Thank you. Hello, friends. I'm Dr. Rohit here. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to speak today on laser-based procedures on the cornea for presbyopia management. I don't have any financial interest directly linked to what I'm presenting today. The type of multifocal lasers on the cornea are divided into uh, the way the lasers uh, work on the corneal uh, plane, means in terms of how it, the ablations are given. I'm going to speak about those, the indications, the pre-op consideration, which is according to be the most important one, the intraoperative parameters and few cases and post-operative protocols. There's a very good article written by me and my colleagues 
is freely available to download on all the presbyopic laser surgery. And most of it I'm going to discuss today. And this is free downloads from Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. And this is the QR code. It is divided into central, peripheral, and laser, laser blended vision. The central LASIK is your pre-max, uh, presbymax, and supracore. Peripheral lasers are not too often used in the platforms today. And blended visions like Press Beyond and Custom Q or uh, read software, which Alcon is trying to bring in the future. And this is again the divided, what I just spoke to, and uh, uh, this is uh, based on how the lasers are given. What are the indications is young press biops, realistic expectation, which is very important, and uh, you have to be tolerant to the monovision. The contraindications are high refractive error, high cylinders, early cataracts, age, which is higher, amblyopia, and contraindication for any laser refractive surgery. What are the preoperative uh, evaluation? It's, it's the same as uh, what you do for uh, LASIK, but a little bit deeper on dry eye orthoptics, which is very important for binocular uh, single vision uh, post uh, changes on the corneal plane, especially in an elderly patient uh, when you do a multifocal laser on the cornea and dysfunctional lens index. You have to rule out all these factors, which uh, we are all aware of when you do a LASIK surgery. Uh, the assessment of vision, the way you assess, especially the near vision, the dominance is very important. And orthoptic tests are very, very important for the procedure. It's important to understand how much can you tolerate, and we call it as a blur tolerance test. And this is a protocol which is used where you block the view of the chat, put 1.5 on the front of the near dominant eye or the existing refraction. That means if the patient is having plus two, you put 3.5 over the refraction and reveal the snell chart and ask the patient to read the 624 vision. How does it appear to him? Is the ghosting present? Yes, no. If it's no, then you know, then you can look at, uh, uh, you know, then patient is uh, reduce the uh, near ad by 0.25. If there's no ghosting, what is the smallest letter he can see? Now make the patient read the near chart. So this is the 624 distance chart. Make him read the near chart. Show him the distance vision again. So you are trying to make him adapt. Ask if the patient, were you aware that the near dominant were blurred? So that at some point of time, if you make him distance and near, if you're wearing with the, with the near dominant eye, which is overcorrected by a 1.5 for the reading, and then the patient says yes, then you can decrease it a little bit. If the patient says no, he tried to see if he can increase a little more from what he's reading, and that would be your near dominance blur test. This is very important because with this only you can take it, take the patient uh, very clear that he can understand the blur in your near dominant eye. Orthoptic examination is very important. It is beyond my scope in this talk to complete this. But again, this is a paper uh, uh, me and my colleagues have written uh, in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Please go through it. It has got beautiful protocols about what we need to do for a refractive surgery. Dry assessment, we all know it's very important. Imaging, corneal topography, biomechanics, epithelial uh, mapping, pupillometry, abrasion index, accommodation, A scan are all important. Pupil is very important for it. If you have a large size pupil, try to avoid a refractive procedure on it because the whole effect of uh, your multifocality is, is will lose. You have to look for dysfunctional lens syndrome if you have a DLI on a pentacam or on a eye trace, higher DLI means if it's, uh, you know, this is on the red scale is normal, on the blue scale, green scale is normal. And if on a red scale is abnormal, you have to be very, very careful if it's on somewhere in here, somewhere in between uh, zones where you have to be careful of not to do it. And even the pentacam gives you the PNS score. Counseling is very important because it tells you about uh, the realistic expectation, the glare halos, and also explain about the progressive condition. Types and principle, Presmimax is on a, a Schwinn platform. It gives you an aspheric in the center and, uh, and it tapers off in the periphery and more of a bi profiling. And it gives you a target uh, of around 0.85 to 1.25 uh, 1 diopters. That's what it targets based on patient's accommodative change. And there are different types of uh, 
uh, platforms like a micro mono vision hybrid and monocular and you can change the type of uh, distance and near and uh, it gives you a different laser uh, uh, profiling based on what you want to achieve and this is the beauty of it especially when you're using a monocular i use a lot of hybrid where one eye for the near is completely uh, it's corrects for the near and the other eye changes a little bit maybe use induces a little bit of spherical aberration so that you don't get a loss of line on the on the distant dominant but you close to get around 0.8 to 1 diopters of near dom near uh, myopic shift which gives you that beautiful uh, uh, intermediate uh, reading distance and monocular vision is where you only treat one eye and uh, the micro mono vision again a different profile and this is how the platform is this is your uh, uh, distant dominant where you are not treating anything and here is your near dominant target is around 0.9 diopters and this is what is targeted to get that 0.9 diopters in this patient and this is uh, beautifully explained about uh, the gain of lines and loss of lines because we had to understand that most of this uh, mesh, uh, published report also show close to around 10 percent of loss of line which you had to explain to the patient supracore is from uh, the motion norm it gives you a central three millimeter ablation profile of around 0.75 to one diopters this is what it happens it's it gives you a central bump and this is how the laser profile in both myopic and hyperopic again you can have a lot of patients could complain at least close to 10 percent of them could show a loss of lines which needs to be explained press beyond is from uh, mel 90 platform from zeiss it uses the way it is it gives you a blended vision where one eye it both the eyes it gives you that induction of spherical aberration also helps in changing uh, the uh, small shift in the myopic uh, uh, laser in the center myopic shift in the center so the fusion of image images between the both the eyes when you have to treat binocular here you that blend zone gives you that perfect near and intermediate uh, vision this is how the platform looks like again uh, most of them are very well within the normal limits but still you can see that that also has some amount of uh, loss of lines so post-operatively you have to be aware of uh, explaining to the patient about uh, you know it's not a magic it takes time and you need to be uh, you need to keep the close watch on their pentagram and other evaluation these are all the routines uh, stuff i don't keep anything different only that you need to be very aware of the dryness and so keep cyclosporin for at least six months and uh, discomfort watering initially tear film changes uh, neural adaptation very important and because you know dryness has a huge because it's elderly people more of dryness and my woman gland loss so you'll have a lot of these changes which you have to be aware of so uh, post op is, is simple simple as as we would do in our routine lasik i would there's nothing different but just keep them aware keep them informed that it is going to take time they have to adapt it and they have to be neuro adapted as much as faster as possible a neuroplasticity has to set in which gives them uh, the best results but the advantages are low complication rate repeat uh, treatment for bronze presbyopia it's reversible most of the machine distance error corrected and presbyopia cannot be corrected in one sitting glare loss of best corrected repeated correction and suboptimal stereopsis are all the challenges associated with this I thank you again and i'm open for any questions now thank you uh, thank you, Dr. Rohit. Uh, that was really very interesting and very extensive on corneal modality of treating presbyopia. Um, so now we are open for discussion. We have still have time. So um, we have one question from the audience, and they uh, I think it's for Dr. Khaled. They ask, please, what is the difference between a true EDOF and other EDOF lenses? Yes, this is a very good question. Is that a true EDOF is the, the EDOF lenses in general, they are using uh, either two main principles. The first principle is the pinhole effect. So if we are talking about three, true EDOF lenses, then we, this lens should use a pinhole effect. And this is the only two lenses that are available are the focus and the extra focus. Uh, and the, the focus is similar to the camera uh, inlay that is used for respiobia. So if the lenses is using a, a pinhole effect, then we can label it as a true EDOF. The other lenses that are available in the market, whether they are monofocal or trifocal lenses, 
they are using the principle of uh, asphericity. They increase the negative spherical operation of the of the eye, meaning that they are using uh, some advantages of the higher order operations so as to increase the depth of focus. So this is the the, the main difference between the 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 true edof and the 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 edof like lenses. But again, this is there is no worldwide consensus or uh, there is no worldwide agreement on how to classify these lenses but this is just a, as a general uh, overview over these lenses thank you um i have one question for uh, professor alio um you actually said very nicely that these lenses which are commutative lenses has to be placed in the sulcus uh, how much of importance do you place in uh, assessing the uh, zonules before the surgery is planned. Yeah, you know, sonoropathies are, are have not been included in our study. So basically, with sonos for lesion, for instance, have not been operated because we consider an exclusion criteria. So I have I can give no 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 answer to this question. I would like anyhow <clears throat> to mention that this is real accommodation. That means that this change in power related to ciliary body action. The patients are from two, three days after the surgery already with near vision, which is amazing. We thought that the accommodation should take time to happen. It's not, you know. And the, 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 very interestingly, is the anterior casual remain, the anterior casual ring, which the one that supports the is the one that is active for accommodation. So the posterior capsule has no role and probably has minimal or no role either in normal accommodation as well. With this in mind, the main advantages can be placed with a with, uh, cash break and can be, uh, and is not affected by the aggressive cash rotum. So now we have uh, the accommodative lenses in the future. These lenses has seen mark, but it's not yet commercial, will be probably at the end of this year or next year. We have the multifocus and the EDOF. And ab about the, the, the previous speaker, Dr. Uh, Halit, uh, yes, I has mentioned, I, we have a classification for EDOF lenses <clears throat> that in my opinion is important because. Uh, there are a lot of fake news with the dog lenses. Multifocal lenses with no low near vision art, they behave in the defocus core for CDO, but they are not it up. They are multifocal with low vision, low, low near vision art. And so for me, a, a real dog lenses are those that have, as Dr. Khalid has mentioned, pinhole and chasing as first, but all the others, except the, the, what we call now monofocal plus, like the VVT or the Ahans, they really are not you know, lenses, but rather multifocal lenses with, with a, the, the focus curve that mimics the dog. So it's much, there has been a lot of confusion because of the commercial misuse of it all. But we're talking about accommodation, which is a different topic. I still, I think that we need two or three years to expand this concept of, of accommodation, but basically be sure, these patients have no halos, no glare, can focus, most of them are spectacle independent. There are variability, but every restoration of function is affected by this. But believe me, I do, I do see the, the future in which the wizard have a community lenses as dominant lenses to implant. Thank you. Yes, I totally agree with Dr. George that these lenses are not a true edof. This, but this, this is the marketing nowadays, and this is the industry Sorry. is pushing toward this term. Maybe they want to get rid of the, the association between multifocal lenses and the dysphotopsias, but still these lenses still have dysphotopsia, and uh, we should warn these our patients about this, uh, this side effect of these lenses. Uh, one question. To, yeah. I have one question for you about the Lumina. Uh, is this lens? Uh, it can be used uh, as uh, a big bag lens or just in the, in the sulcus for uh, after cataract, not for not as a big bag lens, yeah. Well, this is an excellent question. You know, this is in the uh, operate that we have not yet started, but the uh, the Lumina can be manufactured with a plano or plus one or minus one power, and then you will have a very thin lens that can be implanted in the sulcus as a big bag. Definitely, this this should work but we have not yet done this surgery in any one case. So this is a project that, if positive, brings a immense value, clinical and commercial value to the lens, but uh, the, this is still a theory has not been tested so far, you know? But it's true is that uh, the posterior capsule, if rigid, and that happens with any lens that has been planted from some years because fibrosis happens as a mummification process, once the capsule bag is emptied, might affect the performance of the lens, but it's just purely theoretical. We have not 
made this this approach yet, but it's a tremendously interesting approach. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Rohit uh, about the cornea-based uh, procedures for presbyopia. Um, in your uh, practice, do you see these patients who have cornea-based procedures uh, suffer from a lot of glare at night and night vision problem initially and during the uh, period of uh, recovery? Uh, <clears throat> very few. I've used... Uh... Uh, both the uh, uh, Schwind, Melnighty, and uh, Supracore. All the three of them I have in my clinic. And uh, if you explain to them about uh, these things prior and neuro and, uh, this, and in, impress them about the, uh, the, the issue of neuroadaptation, which will take time, most of them don't have problems. So that's why it's very important that we have to do the blur test in the beginning, because many times if they're not accepting it, then they have the challenge. And to my best of my uh, uh, knowledge at this point of time, most of these patients who complain of glare are the ones who have extremely poor uh, orthoptics uh, ish issues, but very poor binocular uh, single vision. So it is very important factor is when you don't fuse well, when you don't, your muscles are not proper, they end up in having extremely poor fusional issues, which cause uh, uh, the glare. So one of the most important thing in my evaluation is to look for any of these changes, the BSV, binocular single vision changes. And if it's there, then we do use, give them uh, orthoptics exercises both uh, before and after surgery. So in the last uh, four years, uh, four and a half years, I've been using all the three platforms, very minimal of these changes. And the last point is that even if they have a very early uh, dis dysfunctional lens uh, index, uh, which is higher, the dysfunctional lens syndrome, you would definitely end up in more glares. So you will have to evaluate them more from the orthoptics and also from the early lens changes. Can I have a question for Dr. Rohit? Because, because the, the, the presbyopia is a, a process that is continuous to, to be more pro with time. What is the duration that you usually tell your patient that this uh, surgery will, will last? Is there a specific um, period? Just the waiting time, sir. Uh, what happens is I usually tell them that after six to seven years, it, you may need uh, enhancement or you may probably go for a IOL based surgery. So I, I don't tell them that it's going to last forever. And uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep sir, the advantage of uh, these procedures nowadays is that you have a software for presbyopia reversal. Uh, Schwind has some software where you can actually reverse the, uh, you use a topo guided treatment, they reverse the changes so they can go back to what they were for the procedure in case if you if they have a, a lot of glare and halos so uh, there's definitely not a procedure where you know patients are unrealistic that's going to last forever it, it comes with definitely an expiry time thank you um, i think we have uh, finished with our time thank you very much thank you all the august panelists thank you very much for your contribution to this uh, Nice uh, symposium. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. Good night.